Hi there, my name is Pastor Jeff Buck. I am filling in for our lead pastor at Calvary Monterey here on my final of four weeks on the series of Books of Colossians. Tuesday Night Bible Study, thanks so much for tuning in. Whatever time you're watching this, we're grateful to have you. We've been enjoying, at least I've been enjoying teaching Colossians 1, 2, 3, and 4, seeing one of the most crystal-centric, Christ-centered books of the New Testament. And I've uh, summarized it several times uh, as we've gone through, so I think I'm just going to jump right into the fourth chapter. We saw at the end of the third chapter, he was talking about family relationships. And I was pointing out whether it was the wives, husbands, children, bond slaves or employees, how each of us has a tendency to go the, the other direction from what a biblical response might be. And so we need a spirit-filled set of directions and changed hearts so that we can live the way the Lord wants. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, we have this, the final part of this uh, series of exhortations on how to live in the different parts of life. And here is uh, master or employer. In Colossians 4, verse 1, Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. That's one of the most important things to know is all of us have a boss. All of us have an ultimate master and usually an earthly one. And it's so important for us to have an eye past our employer to the Lord. And we're told here, think of yourself now as a potential employer or a husband leading your wife or parents leading your children. He says two things here, and all the words of Scripture are there for a purpose. We believe in the perfection of Scripture, what Watchman Nee called the divine economy of Scripture. And here are these wonderful two words, treat your bond slaves, servants, justly and fairly. Oh, people are attuned to something that's not just or not fair. Especially with our children, you will often hear, that's not fair. Because people want to be treated equitably, equitably, fairly, justly. They want to be treated in, in a common sense way with respect and equality with the other employees. And there's a lot in the Bible about justness and fairness, using many times other words. But I'll just leave it there. We are to treat our employees justly and fairly. Think about the kind of boss you want to have and be that to the people under you. I also want to add a very similar exhortation. In Ephesians chapter 6, we have a similar passage and let Scripture illuminate Scripture. Uh, reading in 6.5, I'm just going to read through what it says to the bond slaves and then to the master. Bond servants, great words here for employees, Obey your earthly masters, Ephesians 6, 5, with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would obey Christ. And look at these next ones. Not by the way of eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. This next phrase, doing the will of God from the heart. What a challenge when we're not doing it directly to Jesus, we have some kind of an earthly employer to do the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. He is simply saying, employers and employees Employees who are Christians should be the very best employees. We should be showing up early, staying late, working the same whether we're under the eye of the master or not, doing the will of God, which means for those eight hours that we're working, the will of God is to work with all our hearts for this business, this employer. And we know that whatever good we do there, even if we have a, a difficult boss, 
When we stand before Christ at the judgment seat of rewards, it will be remembered how we did what was right, even though the master wasn't watching. Now we have verse 9. Masters, do the same to them. Treat them in these wonderful ways. And here's a third thing we saw justly and fairly. And here it says, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. So when you stand before Christ, he's not going to say, oh, you were, the, you were the boss. Oh, wow. No, he's going to evaluate, judge, and, and look through his, his eyes of perfection and, and uh, testing with fire the work and attitudes of masters and employees alike. And notice the, the third thing on top of justly and fairly, the, the master is told, stop threatening. There's all kinds of manipulating, uh, threatening, as it says here, abusive words that can be used to try to kind of beat people into doing the right thing. If you have to do that, you've already lost the battle as a master. Threatening, we can get a lawsuit over that anyway, but there's a whole nother way to lead rather than that kind of uh, pressure. And back in chapter four, how do we treat people that we oversee? All I can tell you is myself, I've been a lead pastor m many times in my ministry. I've also been, as I am now, an assistant pastor. So I have an earthly boss. And there's two things that endear employees to us. Number one, communication. When we communicate to those under us what's happening, what we're thinking, where we're going, why things are done, even without defending them, simply communicating why. Here's why we're opening up an earlier hour or staying there a later hour, you know, whatever it might be. Communication endears employees to employers. And number two, Friendly personal contact from boss to employee. Uh, one of the great things to do, and it, and it depends on how many employees that you've got, but for a boss to spend time down on the work floor, down where the machines are, and just plop down next to an employee and just, just talk. Even for 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, you're the boss, you can do that, and just ask, Hey, tell me, tell me more about you. I, re I remember your name, but like, tell me about you. Where are you from? Who are you? Kids, wife, and just showing that interest. The thing about it is, if you're not interested in your employees, you're not going to be able to do this. And if you're not interested in the employees, they know it. So having a personal connection and good communication is, is better than being unjust, unfair, and threatening. So logical, common sense stuff, justly, fairly, no threatening, but communication and personal contact. So actually looking at the outline of this whole final chapter, chapter four, verse one is to employers. Two through six is final instructions to the church at Colossae. And he's gonna talk about prayer and outsiders. And then finally, Verses 7 through 18, final greetings to 11 key people. How important relationships are. But these final instructions, verses 2 and 2 through 4, are going to talk about prayer. Final instructions. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. It's amazing how many times in the New Testament, and I seem to be seeing them at the moment in my own personal study, that we hear about thanksgiving and being thankful. You can thank your way out of any pit, any problem. But he says, being watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us. Don't be too proud uh, to, to ask for prayer specifically for yourself. At the same time, pray also for us that, that now we, first we saw general prayer, watching with thanksgiving. That's general attitude of prayer. And then here is 
very much targeted prayer toward a specific person. At the same time, pray also for us that, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear as I ought to speak. I've heard our lead pastor, Pastor Nate, uh, mention this and pray this many times, prayer that he will be clear in a presentation. So general prayer is called here watching. I actually, years ago, was a part of a movement in the Kansas City area where we had a corporate prayer watch. And it was actually 24 hours of prayer, seven days a week. And in my little church, which was out in the suburbs of Kansas City, uh, we just did it uh, every night. And from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., we had what we called the prayer watch. And I can remember many times getting up on my slot at 3 a.m., <clears throat> having gotten the call from the previous watchman and giving a call to the subsequent one. And we just watched over our city, thanked God for this little town. And we were watchful. Prayer will keep you alert spiritually. It'll keep you awake and watchful. And there is a general attitude of prayer that in his final instructions, he's saying, be like a watchman. Watch over the things that pertain to you, your city, your family, your church, being watchful. But a second kind of prayer in the final instructions is what I call targeted prayer. And this is where Paul is saying, I need specific prayer for me. Would you put me on your prayer list? Would you target prayer for me? And notice these three things that oftentimes really need prayer to come to fruition. He says that God would open a door, that I can speak the mystery, and I can do it clearly. Now, anytime you're speaking a mystery, you, you need the Lord's help to make it clear. And some of the great mysteries and revelations that Paul had, he was able to do it clearly, I assume from this passage, because of the intercessory prayer of people. There were like eight different mysteries that Paul unfolded to the church, things that he saw that others did not. And here he says, pray that God will open the door for me. He's in prison. He may be thinking of the prison door opening. He may be thinking of coming out of prison and, and God opening new cities and, and churches for him to go to. He may be simply praying that as he writes these letters that they'll find their way around the world, which they have done. But these, these targeted questions, Lord, open doors for Paul. Help him to speak the mysteries and revelations you've given. Help him to be clear. So I see here in these final instructions, general prayer, targeted prayer, and then if you skip down for a moment, there is one of his cohorts, his dear friends, Epaphras, who was from, from Colossae. And there's a third kind of prayer that Paul mentions here. Verse 12, Epaphras, who was one of you, he was from Colossae, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you. And look at this, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers struggling, warfare prayer, I call it wrestling in prayer, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Epaphras knew the church at Colossae. He knew their, their strengths and weaknesses, and he saw he needed to labor in prayer, wrestle in prayer, struggle in prayer here, it says, that these the Colossian church, individually and corporately. And what a, what a huge prayer request that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Now that's going to take wrestling in prayer. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we individually and corporately would stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God? Prayer takes people where they would not otherwise go. It enables people to do what otherwise they'd never be able to do. And this thing of maturity and assurance 
are going to come to the church through the watching and the wrestling in prayer. This whole thing of wrestling in prayer, two places that I've seen this a lot of times are number one with missionaries. Missionaries, and, and we have a number of them around the world and a number of them in difficult or, or closed countries. And when we get messages from them, the difficulties that they're facing, you, you want to wrestle in prayer for them. You want to speak to God incessantly for them that they'll be kept safe, that the secret police won't find them, and that God will provide for them. I've seen this wrestling in prayer around missionaries. And number two, chronic sicknesses. When people have a brain tumor, when people's back completely goes out, when cancer comes, whatever it might be, and certain people see this situation, refuse to give up on it, and they wrestle in prayer as though they were hanging on to God saying, God, I am lifting sister, whatever, brother, whomever, or their child. I, I have several of these things rolling around in my heart right now that I've been asked to pray for. And it, it takes wrestling. It takes persistence. It takes not giving up with these missionaries and with sicknesses. It's interesting, in the final instructions, Paul goes to prayer. And that is just part and parcel of a, of a Pauline endorsed life. General prayer, targeted prayer, wrestling in prayer. And perhaps God is leading you to a deeper level of prayer. Not just general prayer, God bless everybody and their dogs and so on and so forth. Not just the watchful and thankful prayer, but targeted prayer. When someone says, hey, would you pray for me? And you might just pray on the spot, but you also might take that back to the prayer closet and take the responsibility of praying specific things you've been asked and, of course, wrestling in prayer. That is a deep, intensive, agonizing Gethsemane kind of prayer. And perhaps God is leading you toward that. And then he has very interesting, in verses 5 and 6, advice toward what he calls, in this translation, outsiders. Outsiders. Sounds kind of exclusive, but he's simply saying people that are not the brothers and sisters that you fellowship inside church. And how great it is to get outside the four walls and to be knocking around with the quote unquote, we don't say this in a condescending way, outsiders. And he simply says in verse five, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. And notice what he says, making the best use of the time. Now, what's really interesting is if that, you see that word time, that is the Greek, not the Greek word chronos, which means the time on the sundial or on your watch, but when it says make the best use of the time, it's the Greek word kairos, which means opportunity or season. There are seasons that you'll find outsiders open to you. There are moments when you sit down next to somebody and realize, oh, I could have a conversation with them. Not just a life witness that I've been having, but I could actually make the best use of this moment, this season, because of their, their openness and because I have to have, to have a few extra minutes. And he goes on to say in verse 6, how we speak to the outsiders. And this is talking now not to the church members, but to people outside, to your neighbors and friends and so on. Let your speech always, anything that requires always is a challenge. Let your speech, speech always be gracious, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how to answer every person. We think, well, man, I don't even know how to talk to my neighbor up the street or and I don't know how to talk to the, my mailman or whatever it might be. He said, well, what you start with is just to be gracious, to be polite, to be gentle, to be interested. It sounds kind of, kind of bad, but the favorite subject of most of us are, is ourselves. And so if I'm, if I'm gracious to you, interested in you, and polite to you, and I'm I season it with salt. I figure out what's going to taste good to this person in this situation. 
and you open up a conversation, then you know how to respond to everyone. You know, when I talk to people like that, there's two basic things that I know I can do when I speak in a gracious way. Number one is I can simply share what's happening in my life, especially with a neighbor, and just connect with them on the basis of, you know, I'm going to have to have a surgery, or, you know, my kids are coming in for the holidays, or whatever it might be. And most of the time, people are interested in what's personally going on with us. Sometimes they'll even ask you, hey, are you remodeling your house? I've seen a lot of people around, or have your kids been around? But sharing what's happening with me, even if they don't ask. You know, I got a kid back in Florida, and they're doing this or that. But the second thing is, ask people about what you know interests them. Not maybe about them themselves, but when you know up the street, like I have some people up the street, real nice people, and they have five cars, and I just love to see the cars come and go because there's only three people, and um, they're the nicest folks, and they out there, they love to work on them and stuff. All I got to do is walk up the street and ask them about cars. And every time now they see me, they wave at me, they honk at me, and it's only because... I've just taken an interest in what interests them. And then I share with them what's happening with me. And the next time I see them, they'll ask me, hey, what happened about? And so being gracious, putting salt on your words, this is his instruction to the, our relationships with the outside world. And we just got to be outside the four walls of the, of the church. Some of us are outside of the four walls of the church all the time. Some of us like me, we have to work at that. So final instructions, prayer outsiders. And then finally, greetings. And Paul is going to model in verses 7 through 18. In his final greetings to 11 key people of all different shapes and sizes, he's going to model for us the importance of relationships. Had an old friend years ago that used to simply say, life is relationships. Good relationships, good life. Bad relationships, bad life. Maybe an overstatement, but a lot of truth in it. So I'm going to read 7 down through 17. And look, at, look for these, uh, these names. And then I'm, I'll share a little bit about each one of them. And what's interesting is the wide variety of the kind of friends that Paul had. Hard to pronounce sometimes, you just do your best. Colossians 4, 7, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a faithful, a beloved brother and faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord. Notice those three compliments. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. I, had, I just have to stop and say, you know, there's, there's a lot of people we could not send to encourage anybody because they're not encouragers. But he's going to go, even though Paul's in prison, and he's going to be an encourager to the church. So I've sent him to encourage your heart, not to depress you or whatever. And then along with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, former slave, but now called the brother, who is one of you. He's from your city. And they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. More on him later. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And then a very interesting little parenthesis here. Concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. (laughs) Now, if you don't know the story of Philemon, the book of Philemon, even then you'll realize there's something loaded about this. There's there's something, um, there's a backstory here, and we'll we'll come back to it. And Jesus, or Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision, uh, Jews, born Jews, among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort for me. Epaphras, who is one of you, from your city, we read this before, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And I bear him witness, 
He has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea in Hierapolis, cities that were close to Colossae. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. When this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you read the letter from Laodicea. I wish we had that Laodicean letter, but as far as I know, we don't. And then say to Archippus, which the Greek word means chief groom, seems like he had a position of leadership. See that you fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. That's a bit of a scolding. That's a bit of a, um, you be sure, young man, that you, that you do this. Here are some of these guys. Tychicus in verse 7. Veteran traveler with Paul. One of the men mentions in Acts 20, verse 4, of the seven companions of Paul. And he's called the beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant, and I've sent him to encourage you. This is a comrade. This is a brother. This is someone I could, could give a message to and send and know he would give my heart. And he remembers to, to commend him because Tychicus is going to take this letter. He's going to go to Colossae and he's going to try to explain all that's happening. In other words, he was, a, he was someone that could be a personal representative of Paul. There's not many people that I would send to give a message or a report of how Denise and I are doing and explain our priorities and all that. Not many people I could send like that. But Paul had spent enough time with this man, invested in him so that he could trust this man, send him out as his own representative and know he would do things as Paul would have done. And then with him, here's another guy that's going to be going along to Colossae, is this guy named Onesimus. Now, if you read the book of Philemon, you'll get the story that Onesimus was a runaway slave from a guy named Philemon, to whom uh, one of Paul's letters is written. Onesimus was a a runaway slave. The penalty in the Roman Empire uh, for a runaway slave was always execution, always death. And Onesimus showed up in Rome where Paul was in prison. And Paul being Paul somehow came across this guy and and converted him, who, who brought him to faith. And then in Philemon, the book, he sends him back with the instruction. Now, Philemon, I know uh, he, his, his name is translated means useful, uh, but I know he ran away and has not been useful to you, and I know he owes you a debt and so on. But anything that he, he owes you, I will pay. All you got to do is let me know because I have seen this guy become a Christian he, he was a, a slave. He was a bum. He was a, 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 was a no good, a runaway. But I'm sending you back because now he is a faithful and beloved brother, one of the church. And he will also tell you what's happening with me. That's one of the great things that anyone can change. In Christ, anyone can change. I rejoice at the number of people that I know that were just impossible Pagan people, no interest in God. Uh, I was more of the polite center, kind of close to the church, you know, but there's a lot of people that are, are, are just nuts, runaways, and so on. And the more of them that there are around, the better I like it. And it's just that proof. In the church, in the body of Christ, there needs to be the up and outer and the down and outer. The people who have had unrelenting success in their life and those who've never been able to put $5 together. And all of us are supposed to live in the body of Christ. So final greetings are treat the slave well. Don't kill him and be kind to him. And a separate letter is is going to tell about that. Then in verse 10, there is Aristarchus uh, from Thessalonica, also part of the gang in Acts 20 verse 4. And if you want to study him a little bit more, he's mentioned in Acts 19.29, and he's in the middle of a riot with Paul. And then in Acts 27.2, he sails with Paul through the shipwreck all the way to Rome. 
In other words, he is with Paul in the difficult times. That's another kind of person. The person that sticks with you when your life is difficult. The person that sticks with you through a divorce. The person who sticks with you when you go broke. Whatever it might be, through sickness, through difficulties with your children. This is Aristarchus, someone that just was with Paul in the good times and the bad times. And you know, when people are with you in the bad times, you you just so treasure them in the good times because you remember, this person stuck with me, this person didn't run, that's Aristarchus. And then Barnabas is also mentioned in verse 10 with Mark. Now Barnabas, as we know in Acts 12, 13, 14 and uh, is one of the, well, he was the first partner that went with Paul in apostolic journeys. In the, in the first uh, and second apostolic journeys, 13, 14 in Acts, Barnabas was his partner. He is someone that uh, found Paul in uh, Acts chapter 9, shortly after his conversion. He introduced him to the apostles and he was a booster and a, just a dear friend of Paul from his early days as a Christian. 12 years earlier, they had a falling out over Mark, who is the cousin of Barnabas. And we we read this in the early part of, uh, late part of uh, Acts 14 and then in 15. And when Paul wants to go on the next missionary journey, Barnabas wants to bring Mark, who had gone home on the first missionary journey and just left without permission. And they have such a a falling out over this that they separate. This was 12 years before this writing. And they have been, as far as we know, we don't know what their relationship actually was, but to some extent it seems they must have been still estranged and uh, not been together. But Mark, whom Paul did not forgive initially when he deserted Barnabas and Paul, is now invited back into his life. He says, now bring Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions. If he comes, welcome him. Everybody knew the, the separation, separation that had happened, the, uh, the breaking of this relationship of, of Paul, Barnabas, and Mark. But here in the end, he welcomes Barnabas back. He just mentions, uh, welcomes um, Mark back. It's interesting, he doesn't say anything about Barnabas other than Mark's his cousin. And so I get the feeling that that rift was not yet healed, trusting that it was at some point. But in any event, we always have, there are people with whom we may have issues. There are people who have disappointed us or betrayed us walked out on us, not stood with us in the past. And the lesson here is, don't write those people off forever. You be open to God bringing people back into your life that maybe have really disappointed you in the past. I can think right now as I'm sitting here of a particular person uh, that this has happened with in the last uh, year or two and how this person uh, took off Several years ago, I was so hurt, so disappointed, and now they're back in our church, back in my life, and it's a a mark lesson. And so, again, different kinds of people through the years uh, with Paul and, of course, through you. And then in verse 11, he just mentions Jesus, who is called Justice. Oftentimes, people had different names, and it simply says, he is a comfort to me. He is a, he's a fellow Jew, so we can talk about the things of Judaism, but he's a comfort to me. You know, there's some people that are just like that. They're just a comfort. They're an encouragement. They're an inspiration. They're someone that you just want to sit with. You don't have to say anything. They're just a comfort to you. I certainly have people like that. I'll bet that you do too. And this is another kind of person We don't know anything about him other than he was a Jew and Paul is mentioning him. He's in Rome, it would seem. Some people are just a blessing. They may not have some great ministry. They may not be hotshots, 
but they, well, they're like you. They have something in common with you. Maybe from the, they're from the South, like you are, or whatever, but they can be a comfort, a fellow worker and a comfort. Then he mentions Epaphras, we've already covered him. He is uh, from Colossae. And it's interesting, other than Paul calling himself and Timothy bond slaves, this is the only other guy that Paul used that same word, uh, bond servant, about. So Epaphras, like Paul and Timothy, this guy would get down dirty. A bond slave was the lowest form of a slave with, with no rights and all responsibilities. And so the apostles described themselves as bond servants, the lowest kind of servant. And the only other guy that Paul calls this, besides Timothy, is Epaphras. And I think that ongoing relationship is partly because of prayer. Epaphras was a guy, <clears throat> as it says here, who would struggle in prayer. And when you pray for people, and especially what a mature prayer, it says in the last part, it's always struggling in your behalf in his prayers. Now, what, what is he praying? Fa fabulous prayer. That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And this is someone that Paul wanted to have around because he was a praying person. I left Calvary Fort Lauderdale as a staff member uh, 13 years ago now. But I have never been able to get rid of my burden to pray for the lead pastor, Doug, and some of my friends there. I, of course, I have a daughter that lives there. But something about prayer has kept me connected with them. And when I go back, they welcome me back. And we have that relationship partly because I just don't stop ever praying for my former church. Anyway, there's people like that in our lives. They're always praying for us and they're bond servants. And then there is dear Luke, the beloved physician who greets you. Luke is called a physician here. That's the only time that we know that Luke's relationship with Paul was friend and fellow missionary, but also a physician. Man, it's wonderful to have a physician if you're Paul and you're getting beat up and <laughs> stoned and all the different things. And it's interesting, if you study the book of Acts, you will see, of course, we know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. In chapter 16, verse 8, the writer Luke is speaking of as he has the, the early part of the uh, apostolic journeys, as he describes, he says the word they. They went there, here, they did that. But in Acts 16, verse 10, all of a sudden it says, we went here or we went there. And then we see, without Luke bragging on it, he just uses the word we, and we say, oh, this is where Luke the doctor came into Paul's life. In 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul, in the very last part of the last book he ever wrote, he says these words, 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. At the end of his life, the one that was still there was Luke. By my reckoning, Luke had a 17-year relationship with Paul. And at this time, when he writes 2 Timothy 4, Paul is seemingly months away from execution. And the guy that cared for him physically and emotionally and spiritually was still there. Oh, I hope that you have someone like that in your life. I have a couple of physician friends in the church. I'm going to have coffee with one uh, one o'clock today. And I just love hanging out with the physicians and caring for them because no one seems to care for them. They care for everyone else. But here is the beloved physician ministering to Paul. And then notice it says in the same sentence, Luke, the beloved physician greets you as does Demas. Just that little mention. And of course, there is a story behind this. Seven years earlier, 
He's mentioned uh, in 1 Timothy. But in this passage, uh, if we went to 2 Timothy 4.10, a few years later, Demas left Paul and went off into the world. And we all have people like that, that even at this point, we can say their name, but we may have had a seven-year estrangement. Paul mentions him. He doesn't say to pray for him. He doesn't say anything other, but he mentions his name. And I think that's kind of cool that he, he brings him up. Even in 2 Timothy 4.10, as he said, you know, he's left me. Here he mentions him. And so, again, there may be that person that you comes to your mind when I'm thinking about this, that they've gone off into the world. That's what it specifically says of Demas. He went to Thessalonica, but Paul says he went off into the world. There are people that seem to be in the church, but they're really in the world. And, you know, we are called to embrace people as brothers and sisters, and then sometimes we get hurt. When that's happened to me, I've gone into my shell for a while thinking, I don't want to have this happen again. I don't want to have another Demas experience. And then you realize, I just can't do that. We don't know if Demas ever reconciled with Paul. It doesn't sound like it, but he mentions him. 15 then. I like this. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church that's in her house. Now, if you know your Latin or your Greek at all, you'll see that Nympha is a feminine name. If it was Nymphus, A-S, it would be a man. But at least in some of the manuscripts and in the ESV translation, it is a woman. Give my greetings to this woman and the church in her house. I love the fact that on the one hand, Paul took a very clear stand on the position of women in life and women in ministry and women in the church. And at the same time, he's greeting a woman who's dear to him and how Paul loved and respected, as did the Lord Jesus, the women who supported him all through his ministry. Where would we be without women? Where would we be without our sisters in Christ, our wives, our daughters? I have four daughters. What a blessing. The, the nurturing attitude that women often have, the detailed work that they're willing to do, the respect that we need to give them. And here he, he specifically greets the women. Man, I have so many friends who are women and so many women that I so respect in ministry, in business. Where would we be without the women? And then finally, and I'm going to read uh, verse 17, and say to Archippus, here's this, um, this warning, this exhortation, see that you fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. You know, ministry can be unfulfilled. How many people I've known who are running the race and then veered off or got tired? or, or last, lost vision. He says to this man who may be the son of Philemon, owner of Onesimus, he may be the son of, of that man and perhaps been the lead elder of that church at Colossae. We don't know. But he says, be sure you fulfill the ministry that you have received. Ministries and callings are received. We don't earn them. God simply assigns them to us. Ministry can be unfulfilled, not finished. And I know for me, I think at age 67, I don't, I, I want to finish the race. I don't want my ministry unfulfilled. I hope you're the same way, that you get in the final instructions to these 11 people, this basic word, hey, finish the race. Be faithful. Don't get off at the wrong turn. And if you do get right back on the highway, finish your race. And then when you stand before Christ, what a joy it will be when he says, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy. So just a few final comments. 
talking about masters, final instructions in prayer, outsiders, and these greetings. And I'm, I'm touched by these, these greetings. Same with Romans chapter 16, that Paul obviously had so many friends, even though he was, he was unmarried and he was itinerant. He had friends everywhere. Even on the way to Rome in Acts 27, as he sailing across the Mediterranean, every place they stopped, there were people that he knew or people who knew of him and took care of him. relationships. Some thoughts about that. In your life, I recommend life groups. I do recommend, even though it may seem artificial to you, to jump into some life group. I've been in the same life group now and led the same life group for four or five years. And what a blessing it's been to have these people in a regular Bible study fellowship format with deeper relationships come through life groups. A second thing, though, is it takes time to cement relationships. And most of us are too busy for relationships. They're kind of a, of a sidebar, and if we get to them, it's fine. But we've got to have the kinds of people that Paul just modeled here. Busyness prohibits or slows down relationships. But life groups help looking at your schedule and getting ahead, and maybe it's, it's three weeks before you have an open night, but go three weeks ahead and say, I'm going to invite this person, that person, that family, because the third thing is meals together. Whenever we put our knees under the same table as other people, there is a different aspect to it. And then the fourth thing is just basic hospitality. You don't have to have the perfect apartment or home, but you can say to somebody, hey, come over after church. We'll just, we'll just have some sandwiches. Just open your home. It's kind of messy today. I didn't really clean it yesterday. But hospitality, so important. And finally, if you're the kind of person that needs a little inspiration in relationships, uh, study other cultures. Or if, like me, you've had the blessing of going to some other places. I was in Israel once, and the bus driver insisted that uh, the other leader and I come to his house one night. Uh, it was near Nazareth. Actually, it was in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. And the bus driver took us to his home. In their culture, when you invite someone to your home, it is a big deal. His wife had been cooking for two days. And when we came into this meal, it was unbelievable. And they just kept bringing more food, more food, more food, until I just wanted to cry. <laughs> but my fellow uh, tour leader, when we went out, said, that is an amazing thing that's never happened to me on all my tours, that they had a, a, an affection for us, and the bus driver took us to his home. When you open your home. When I was in Cuba, we had a situation where we were in Havana uh, on, I think it was my first time down in Cuba, and we needed to get to the other side of the island and fly to Santiago. And we went to the airport in Havana and tried to get a flight, and we couldn't. And, and so uh, the gate agent who was trying to help us, and I, I, I still don't understand how this happened. The gate agent said, uh, okay, I, I'm going to help you. My boss is not in today, but she closes the, 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 that particular uh, ticket spot. And she walks us a few blocks outside the airport to her boss's home knocks on the door unannounced, and her boss comes to the door. And she, she says, oh, come in, come in, come in. And, and we're having the, the wonderful Cuban coffee. And this boss finds out our predicament. And she, I can't remember if she went back to the airport with us or not, but she solved the problem. And I thought, what a culture that is. Do we have these, those kind of relationships we see there that you drop everything and you help someone else. Final thing, kind of a sad final sentence. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. And then he says these words, remember my chains. Remember my chains. He ends with grace be with you. 
But those three words, so poignant, remember my chains. My dear friends, don't forget, don't forget me. Don't forget for, for a guy like Paul to always be chained was a, was a terrible thing. Often chained to a soldier, often chained to a wall, we don't know. Remember my chains. So important that we remember the people that are in chains. I love the book of Colossians. And so what I'd like to do now is to lead you in a prayer over this, this final chapter. I've seen here in the chapter the right treatment of those we oversee. That's that verse one about masters. And then we saw prayer, general targeted wrestling. And then finally, we saw 11 different people with whom Paul had a great relationship. And I want to pray with you that God would take us deeper. As we close our study and then we look forward to Pastor Nate being with us next week, I'd like to lead you in prayer and pray over you for the application. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for how it speaks to, to all of us a little differently. But there's a, a framework to it that we can all grab hold of. And thank you for this word to those who oversee other people, to bosses and to parents, to those who are ahead of housing associations, and neighborhood watches, whatever it might be. And we are told to be just and fair and not to threaten. Any of us, Lord, that have positions of authority, may we be the kinds of people that are personally involved with employees and we treat them well. Lord, bless those of us who have people under us that we might be a light to them. And Lord, about prayer, would you take us deeper into the place of prayer? General prayer, watchful prayer, Targeted prayer for specific people that you burden us with. And of course, when we see these impossible situations that we wrestle in prayer. Sometimes in the night, sometimes alone. But Lord, take us deeper into prayer and take us deeper into relationships. We are such westernized people that relationships are, are kind of something we have and something that we don't. But we, we look at these friends that Paul had, and, and I, I kind of drool over it and think, I want to have all these kinds of people in my life, and I want to be seen like these people back to them. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for changing us progressively into the image of Christ. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for all that you've done for us in Christ. We don't deserve any of it but how you've blessed us and how you've taken care of us. And we commit the rest of our day to you and our lives to you. In that precious name of Jesus, who said, grace be with you through your servant Paul. May grace be upon us. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the study next week.